Hey, 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 happy Thursday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch, hopefully, is in the air. Howdy, gang, and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch. Brought to you by, shockingly enough, thegaminggang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So welcome aboard. This is take two. Tonight is Thursday, March 28th, 2024. And this is live stream 1039. Of course, if you're not overly familiar with this show, let me point out super, super casual around here. Just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news. And then usually I will talk about something that's currently going on in our hobby. Little bit different tonight because I'm actually going to focus on a story of why you don't mess with me. I made reference to this on Tuesday, and I've gotten some comments and some emails asking me to elaborate on this story. So tonight, that is what I shall do. So after I do the tabletop gaming news, if you want to kind of book on out of here, I completely understand. Completely understand. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com. For our latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more, you are not going to find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. And of course, because this is a live stream, there is chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. And normally, you used to have to be a subscriber to the channel for 48 hours before you got to take part in chat. I have adjusted that. So right now, as long as we don't burn the place to the ground, I do have it where you have to be a subscriber, but you only have to be a subscriber for five minutes. First out the gate tonight in the second go round is my high school friend, Scott Weagle. Scott is joining us. Good to see you. Kathy Evans is here. Royce as well as Kevin King, the madman is popping on in again. One of our chat moderators, as is Kevin R. Smith, Garolyn, Semper Buffo, Kabuki Kid, that's right, double K's in the house. Matthew Constantine is also popping on in, as well as James Eck, Stacking Limit, who I believe might be a first-time visitor in chat. Some reason that nickname isn't ringing a bell. Watch, I'll be like, Jeff, I'm here every night. What the hell's wrong with you? Why don't you recognize me? So yes, good old Xfinity decided to drop the internet connection, which it now does multiple times a day, but usually not at this time. It's usually between 12 and 1 o'clock in the afternoon and 12 and 1 o'clock in the morning every once in a while about 5 p.m., it's like clockwork now. And I have called Xfinity and they're like, oh, we don't do, there's nothing going on. It's like, yes, there is, because it happens every flipping day. Dusty Trekkie is with us, as is Kochansky, another first timer, I do believe. Stacking Limits says they are a longtime lurker such as our good friend, the lovely and talented Miss Sarah D. She might be floating around. Kabuki Kid says Xfinity is causing havoc. Always, always. So also should mention that the Gaming Gang March tabletop role-playing game Madness 
is down to the finals. That's right. We started with 64 role-playing games. And I will, in just a bit, discuss the two left standing. And they are no surprises whatsoever. So let's get on into the news. Because making its way into stores in April is Evenfall. Or Evenfall. I think it's called Evenfall. Here's the latest from Matago. It's Evenfall, and the clans of magic are preparing for a new era. Evenfall is the time when the boundaries of reality collapse and the supernatural awakens. The world tree opens its glowing gateways to unknown distant regions. Send witches from your clan to discover and control new places of power. Use them for arcane rituals and battle for the favor of the power stones. But there is only one seat on the enchanted throne. Do you have the skills to lead the world into a new era? Evenfall is a card-driven engine-building game with both novel and familiar mechanisms. Manage your resources, execute your actions in an efficient order, and discover card and action synergies that generate victory points. The game ends after three rounds, then the player with the most points wins. This features engaging card-driven gameplay and engine-building mechanics. Immerse yourself in the world of Evenfall. There's also variable clan board options, as well as competitive and scalable play. And of course, beautiful artwork and components. Evenfall is for one to four players, ages 14 and up. Plays in one to two hours. It's going to carry an MSRP of $59.99. And it lands in stores on April 19th. I did share news of this game back in November. I got to say, it has a pretty spectacular table presence, it appears. Really, really impressive artwork. And it sounds kind of kind of cool. Looks pretty cool. So I did want to share the news that it is arriving in stores next month. So move on to some role-playing game news. Because currently up on Kickstarter for Pickpocket Press, say that five times fast, right? Pickpocket Press, Pickpocket Press. Might as well be Peter Piper picking a peck of pickled peppers. Regardless, they are releasing Tales of Argosa. And here's the scoop. Tales of Argosa, a.k.a. Low Fantasy Gaming 2nd Edition, is a sword and sorcery inspired emergent play adventure game for groups or solo. Adventures are short, sharp, and focused on dangerous wilds, treacherous cities, fierce battles, daring exploits, perilous magic, fabulous treasures, and cosmic weird. It features a familiar D20-based system, nine classes, including the Artificer, or the Alchemist variant, if you'd like, Barbarian, Bard, Cultist, Fighter, Monk, Ranger, Rogue, and Magic user. Only two of which involve magic. There is a ninth level max cap for PC power levels. Flatter hit point curves. Most PCs will have approximately 10 to 40 hit points over their nine levels. Unique features. So every third level design your own PC ability in conjunction with your game master where you can choose from over 40 examples. Roll under for attribute checks, making every stat point matter. I always like that. I like the roll under. And if you roll equal to, it's a failure. I'm guessing that's probably what's going on here. Degrees of success via great successes and terrible failures. Roll high for attack and damage rolls. Wisdom is split into perception and willpower. Perception modifiers apply to ranged attacks instead of dexterity. Simple skills grant a plus one bonus on relevant attribute checks, but more importantly, allow a player character to access their limited reroll pool if they fail. The variant rules chapter includes a further simplified class, race, and background combo to replace the skill list if desired. Minor, major, and Rescue exploits on top of damage, not in lieu of, to promote improvised stunts and moments of greatness. Fast initiative, side-based initiative, but a different player character rolls each round. Initiative is a derived stat. 
an average of dexterity and intelligence. If the player character makes their initiative check, the party goes first. Otherwise, the monsters do. On a great success, the party also acts before any heavies or bosses. And lots, lots more. There is a short Kickstarter video. It's a couple minutes long. So let's kick back and give it a peek. Welcome, friend, to Tales of Argosa, an emergent play adventure game inspired by classic stories of sword and sorcery bound together in one mighty tome. The Deck of Signs, an open question oracle of 50 cards with 200 keywords, a multitude of fates. Consult the Bones Dice Oracle and blue activity die to complement reaction rolls. Observe now the core features of Argosa. Fierce battles. Dangerous wilds. Fabulous treasures. And ruinous magic. A cornucopia of beasts and monsters. Party retreats and chases. Divine blessings and rebukes. Party bonds and unique features. Equipment and slot encumbrance. Natural 19s and trauma tables. Hirelings and mercenaries. Customizable experience point advancement. Downtime activities. Group play or solo. An abundance of GM tools and much more. Playtest document, character sheets, and an adventure, all free to pursue at your leisure. We must join with them. Join with Argosa. It would be wise, my friend. This Kickstarter project is hovering right about the 200% funding mark. You can reserve a copy of the core rulebook hardcover with PDF for a $65 pledge or grab just the PDF alone for a $25 pledge through April 7th with an expected delivery this November. And as the madman points out, it's pronounced Argosa, not Argosa. My wise ass. <laughs> I don't know. Do you think I watch these videos? I just go, yeah, it's got a video. Let's upload it to Kickstarter. Or not to Kickstarter. Upload it to YouTube. Oh, I don't, I'm not getting flagged for <laughs> copyright infringement? Okay, sweet. I'll use it. <laughs> Jeez, man, how much time do you think I got in a day? <laughs> Coco B, Agile Monk, and Jose Fernandez are in chat with us. Looks like we got a nice chat rocking and rolling like we did early on. And then Xfinity just blew that up. Sons of bitches. <laughs> I should also mention, you caught at the end of that video, they were talking about the PDFs being available for free over on Drive-Thru RPG. That is true. It's over 300 pages of playtest materials that you can check out absolutely free. I actually downloaded them so I could take a quick peek myself. I haven't had an opportunity to take a look, but I've always heard good things about low fantasy gaming. Never had an opportunity to take a peek at it. And it seems as if this is going to be a lot more than just a second edition of low fantasy. I think there is a lot more being changed mechanically than previously. I could be absolutely wrong, but I, I think that is the case. Flint Fireforge is back with us. Yes, thankfully, quite a few of you are returning once again after the stream dropped. 
Fingers crossed we don't have any issues with that again. Now available in print and PDF from Phantom Mill Games is The Valley of Flowers. At least that's how I think it's pronounced, madman. <laughs> Here's what I know. The Valley of Flowers is a fantasy campaign setting of mythic adventure designed for use with old-school tabletop role-playing games. Inspired by Arthurian literature and weird fiction, the book features 144 full-color pages of succinct yet vivid descriptions of locations, encounters, characters, rumors, and adventure sites. To be honest, I think it's actually up to 150 pages now. It could be wrong. With an original system of oaths and quests, you can set your players loose in Noloon, the Valley of Flowers, and let them explore every strange and treacherous corner of the province, from the monster or haunted wilds of the Gnarl to the hundred towers of riverbound Simbrine. There's five distinct regions, each with its own encounter tables and sites of interest. Five dungeon locations, including the God-Sloshed Abbey. Talking about like a drunken god? The prison of Sir Theobald and the perfumed tomb of the Necropoet. About a dozen additional adventure sites, including the Shadow Farm, the Ignoble Court, and the Hungry Amphitheater. Yum, yum. There's also a guide to the capital city of Simbrine. It's got virtual tabletop-ready province, city, and dungeon maps, as well as numerous factions and powerful beings for the player characters to challenge, serve, or sabotage. From the decadent silvered nobles to a reawakened god of revelry and drunkenness. There's uncanny monsters, wily NPCs, and arcane relics aplenty. And this is statted for old school essentials and cairn. There's an original system of oaths and quests to get your characters more deeply enmeshed in the strange and exhilarating world of Wildendrim. The 144 or 150 page, I'm not sure which, full color hardcover with PDF is available for an MSRP of $35. Or you can grab just the PDF alone over at Drive Through RPG for $15. This looks really, really interesting, I must say. I know I had someone send me an email. This is yesterday, and they had asked me to go back to covering Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons because I'm wasting my time talking about these small role-playing game publishers. And my response to that is... Wizards of the Coast does not need any sort of promotion from me. But myself sharing news pieces from companies like Phantom Mill Games, right? And talking about Kickstarters for Low Fantasy Gaming 2nd Edition. Because <laughs> I don't want to mispronounce the name again. Does a whole lot more for them than me talking about Wizards of the Coast. So, sorry if you think I waste my time talking about these small fry companies. Come on. Come on. Everybody needs a, you know, needs a shout out. Tony Yurkides is back with us in chat. Flynn Fireforge says they love hearing about small game companies. I know, because a lot of times those smaller game companies have some really cool stuff. On to the next news piece, now available for pre-order, is Traveler the Fifth Frontier War, and I've got the skinny from Mongoose Publishing. The Third Imperium has fought four frontier wars against the Zidani Consulate and its allies. Worlds have changed hands. Borders have been readjusted. But never has the Imperium been seriously threatened until now. As the Dani battle fleets emerge from the jump space at Regina, Ifate, and Jewel, something is different this time. The Imperials are divided, arguing over who should be Sector Duke 
even as raiders tear through the Lunion and Glisten subsectors. Lant is under ground attack. Extolay is burning. The Imperial response is fragmented and ineffective. Reinforcements are months away, and the Sector Admiral is frittering away what forces he has. Jump into a trench at the fall of Lant, or join the intrigue at the Ducal Court at Mora. Run weapons to the Ina Gavar insurgents, or chase Sword World raiders across Lunion. Hold back the Zodani tide at the First Battle of Regina, or lead the breakthrough of the 40th Fleet as it lunges at Mycene. These are the great events that will shape the future, and it may be that the outcome rests on the actions of your travelers. The Fifth Frontier War is the first source book in this massive campaign that can span years of play and will powerfully alter the future of the charted space universe. Right now, you can pre-order the 194-page hardcover with PDF for $49.99 or grab just the PDF alone right now over at DriveThruRPG for $29.99. Impressive. Most impressive. <laughs> Good to see some major events taking place in the Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition series. So this sounds like this is going to be a big, big deal. And Traveler is in the finals for the Gaming Gang March Tabletop Role-Playing Game Madness! That's right. It is one of the two role-playing games left standing. Although I have to admit, the voting began for the finals today, and it is getting shellacked by a different system. I will tell you who that is, in case you don't know, in just a moment. But first, on to the next news piece, the final news piece. Because Modifius Entertainment has released the Fallout the Role-Playing Game Wanderer's Guide, here's what I know. Journeying through the devastated wasteland, resourceful wanderers from all walks of life travel from settlement to settlement in order to survive and sometimes even thrive. Now the Wanderer's Guide book for Fallout the Role-Playing Game gives you new tools to create wanderer characters, equip them with weapons and vehicles, send them into the wasteland to face deadly new adversaries. The Wanderer's Guidebook includes a wealth of content for both players and game masters. If you want new character origins, perks, and equipment, you'll find them here. If you want quick and easy scavenging locations, look no further. But watch out for the expansive bestiary full of creatures and factions that make the wasteland so dangerous. Within the 236-page Wanderer's Guidebook PDF, you'll create new characters from brand new origins, including the Brotherhood Outcast, Child of Adam, Nightkin, Robots, and more. Scavenge anywhere in the wasteland with pre-built locations or use them to create your own. Spend your luck for chances at more loot. Get ahead of the competition with 54 brand new perks. Become fireproof. Fight like a gladiator. Work those healing hands or become a natural-born survivor. Remind everyone why you're special. Loads of new equipment just waiting to be found in the wasteland. Create your own legendary weapons and armor. Introducing vehicles and new rules to tear across the wastes. Roll in style in a <laughs> chrysalis cherry bomb. Or soar the skies in a vertebrate. Create unforgettable legendary foes and creatures with new optional rules. Evolve your enemies with new legendary abilities that mutate as the fight goes on. Face off against a myriad of new creatures and foes from cryptids, mutated experiments, and iconic factions across the East and West Coasts. This 236-page Wanderer's Guide is out in PDF right now over at DriveThruRPG for $22. And strangely enough, I do not know if this is actually going to be available as a physical book. There is no pre-order at this point in time. Kind of surprised. 
we shall see. Because I, it's clocking in at 236 pages. I do understand from time to time when Modifius Entertainment releases, say, an adventure that's maybe 25, 30 pages. Yeah, a lot of times they just release those as PDFs. This, I would think, would be a physical book. But I got to be honest, I don't know. I do not know. We've got some new folks hanging out in chat. Let's see, who do we have here? No enemies here. My gosh, it has been a long time since no enemies here popped on in. Very nice to see you. Let's see, we've also got 245 Trioxin. Chris Lundgren is with us, as is Nine Pin Press. I believe Nine Pin Press is another first-timer popping on in. And they mentioned they are a co-writer of Valley of Flowers. So they do say thanks for the mention. What are you talking about, man? I'm wasting my time talking about companies like that. I'm only supposed to talk about Wizards of the Coast, the Dungeons and Dragons. And obviously enough, the eight people who made Dungeons and Dragons cool. I'm not going to let that article go. You know that. <laughs> All righty. So that is the news for tonight. Of course, I was just talking about drive through RPG. Don't forget, the gaming gang, thus the dispatch is affiliated with the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to visit, say, drive through RPG or Dungeon Masters Guild, Storytellers Vault, Wargame Vault, what have you, please stop by thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I will get a small portion of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up and help keep thegaminggang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you like the video, if you dig the channel, if you find thegaminggang.com to be a valuable resource, hell, if you just like what we do, you can always swing on over to paypal.me slash thegaminggang and make a small donation. You can always buy me a two-liter bottle of soda. Refreshing. I was able to get diet right. Yes, yes. My fave. Anywho, there are some of you out there who will also stop on by and make not small donations as well. So thank you very much, all of you out there, if you're utilizing those banner ads and or visiting paypal.me, the gaming gang, really means a lot. And you really do go a long way to keeping not only the website around, but this channel around too. So thank you very kindly. Chris Lundgren says, uh, thanks, last night's topic was well done. You know, honestly, I thought it, thought it kind of meandered a little bit too much. I did get a couple of comments that I thought were pretty rude. So I was like, you know what? Because I always love when I get these people who have never watched the show before. They've never watched any videos on the channel. Even, they're, even though there's now what, over 1,700 of them. And they'll make some comment like, one of them was, was fairly rude and they summed it up by saying, you know, I don't have one or two hours to watch these videos. Look, look me in the eye here. Do you, do you see me caring? Because you don't. <laughs> it's like... We talked about this last night, this, this weird self-importance that these, not everybody, but a lot of people have in the world. Like, oh my gosh, your opinion really matters, even though I have absolutely no clue who you are. And there are always people who have absolutely no content, no subscribers, never 
uploaded a video for anything. They don't even have favorite videos. It's like, yeah, okay, bye. It's like, so long. Kevin R. Smith said, that's what <laughs> two times speed is on Memorex for. I would think that was be pretty quick. Stacking Limit thought it was a, a pretty good show last night. Well, thank you very much. I didn't, I didn't think it was awful. I just thought it kind of meandered a bit. And I think there were probably people who tuned in to check out the video who thought I was going to just regale them with tales of gatekeeping or something along those lines, which was not going to be the case. Perkins Dearborn is joining us. Good to see you, Perkins. All right, so I am going to be sharing a story about why you do not fuck with me in just a few moments. But I do want to mention that we are down to the finals for the Gaming Gang March tabletop role-playing game madness. And as many people thought, it is Call of Cthulhu versus Traveler. So those are the finals. There are two places you can vote. You can vote on the community page for the Gaming Gang right here on YouTube. And if you follow me on Twitter, you can vote there as well. And Chaosium Inc. has shared it. So there are many people popping on in to vote for Call of Cthulhu. In fact, I think it's running 75-25 percentage-wise at the moment. So if you are interested in seeing me running Traveler rather than Call of Cthulhu, get to work, everybody. No enemies here says self-importance and anonymity helps them be someone. Keldon's with us in chat, says Jeff's about to dunk on everyone. No, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell a story that has nothing to do with gaming. But I referenced it on Tuesday and people were interested. So I'm going to tell the story. So we are going to do that. But first, I think it's time for a brief intermission. It's intermission time, folks. Time out for a delicious snack in our sparkling refreshment building. Every item a fresh, appetizing taste treat. Harry, I just love to go to the movies with you because you always have money for popcorn. Oh, surprise. <laughs> Get a hot dog. I can't, Harry. Your brother is holding my hand. My brother? Well, I thought he was your brother. How about a chocolate sundae? I'm going to visit my grandmother that day. Who's going to go to the snack bar to get some 7 Up, the Uncola? Harry, my back still hurts from the last time. A big, fresh land. You can see the bigness, feel the freshness. And in Ham's beer, you can taste it. A taste as big and fresh as the land of sky blue water. Ham. Mmm, Ham. Refreshing as the land of sky blue water. Ham's the beer refreshing. Ham's the beer refreshing. <laughs> Want a cup of Wilkins coffee? What'll Mr. Wilkins do if I don't? Oh, he'll probably put his foot down.
Introducing Munchos. Munchos. The all-new potato snack from Frito-Lay. Like Munchos. It's not a potato chip, it's a potato crisp. Love Munchos. It's thicker than a potato chip, thus it's crisper with more potato flavor. Found Munchos. Mm. Try them. You'll discover there's more to a muncho. Take that, culture appropriation. Yeah, some pretty bizarre ads there. Kabuki Kid says, I like munchos, but holy smokes, are they salty. Yeah, they're kind of an odd-tasting potato crisp, that's for sure. Kevin R. Smith mentioned that they had voted for Traveler in the finals because they wanted to see something different as opposed to Call of Cthulhu, which is what I normally run. And Garolin pointed out they voted for it as well. So did I. I vote, I can vote. So I only get one vote. But yes, I voted for Traveler too. But the thing is, Mongoose Publishing did not retweet that. They have not shared it with their audience. Chaosium Inc. did. So of course, that's driving people to vote. And they are voting for Call of Cthulhu. So there is that. John Muscola is hanging with us tonight. Okay, so as promised, I'm going to share this story. And I will have to say that as I tell this story, I'm probably not going to be checking out chat too much. Otherwise, the story is just going to end up going all over the place. So, as I mentioned, I am not someone who should be trifled with so back in the day, this, this takes place about 26, 25, 26 years ago. So the early part of my career was spent in sales. So I worked for a custom clothing company out of school. I became a regional manager. And then I ended up moving from Chicago to Albuquerque, New Mexico, because a friend of mine had moved out there and they weren't doing too well. And I moved out there to, to help out. I had split up with my fiance because I was miserable. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go help him out. And, uh, you know, he, I've always been a pretty personable guy. If uh, my friend Scott is still hanging out in chat, he can attest to it. You know, even in high school, I'm you know, pretty outgoing, you know, sort of character. I wasn't like real shy by any stretch of the imagination. So anyway, so I worked in sales. And then when I went out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I became a bartender. That's where I learned how to become a bartender. And I did not go to bartending school. I learned on the job. And the reality is some of the worst bartenders I ever worked with went to bartending school. And most places when they're hiring bartenders do not want graduates from bartending schools. Yes. So anyway, so I lived out in Albuquerque, New Mexico for about two and a half years. And my friend Ed uh, had met a woman. He was getting married. Actually, he got married. And uh, I figured, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go. I mean, that was nothing too exciting was going on out there because it's Albuquerque, New Mexico. And when I first moved out there, I remember I was hanging out with a, a girl and some of her friends. And this guy asked me where I was from. And I told him I'm from Chicago. And he said, oh, what's there to do in Chicago? And I was like, well, you know, if you like sports, we've got a team for every major sport, museums, concerts. We got the lakefront, you know, all this stuff. And I said, what is there to do here in Albuquerque? And he said, I'll never forget this, we drink and we fuck. And the reality is, that's pretty much what people did out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, to pass their time. There are other things to do, but 
you know. So anyway, so I come back to Chicago and I was like, ah, yeah, do I want to continue tending bar? I mean, I made decent money, but I was like, ah. So I end up going to an interview for a sales position and it's for uh, admissions for an online college. Now, online colleges were just starting up, starting to become kind of a big deal. So I go to this interview and they hire me and they said, you know, we're going to have this big orientation class and then we're going to like weed people out. I said, okay. So it was called American Intercontinental University and they were part of Career Education Corporation. Now, they both still exist. So anyway, so I go to the orientation and I, no joke, there's got to be 150 people in this orientation. So we, we have about a week of training and essentially we're talking to prospective students over the phone and looking to get them enrolled. Now, this school was regionally accredited. So if you know anything about education, you should know that your credits need to come from a regionally accredited institution because otherwise they don't transfer. And the reality is any college can decide that they're going to refuse the transfer of credits from any other school. doesn't matter if you went to Harvard and then you are going to go and finish up a degree at a state college, that state college could conceivably say, well, you know what? We're not going to take those credits from Harvard. Would it ever happen? Absolutely not. But it could happen. But I can tell you, most certainly, if you go to a school that's not regionally accredited, those credits aren't going to transfer. It's not, most schools that you would go to that have like national accreditation, their degrees are not worth the paper they're printed on. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't go to a school that gives you like a certificate for phlebotomy and, you know, things like that. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying those college credits don't transfer. So the big deal was it was regionally accredited. So anyway, so I was doing really well. So I was there for a couple of months. Or no, I was there for three months and doing really well. And I've always done well in sales. And I'm, I've never been somebody who twisted anybody's arms or, you know, read people the riot act. Or I was, I was never like a used car salesman. In fact, over the years, I had people tell me that I should get into the used car business because they needed salespeople like me because it has, you know, used car salesmen have such terrible reputations. So anyway, so I'm, I'm working at this company. I'm there three months and I'm up for a review. And this place had just exploded. So it occupied a floor of a, a, an office building out near O'Hare Airport. It was still in the city, but it was just off the Kennedy Expressway, for those of you who are familiar with the Chicago area, which few of you are, not a lot, there are a few. And it took up the entire floor of this office building. And in the three months I was there, they were actually taking over another floor of the office building. And all we kept hearing about was how this Career Education Corporation was now worth billions of dollars and how their stock price was just exploding. So I'm there three months and I get brought in for a review and they tell me that they want to promote me and they want to make me one of the managers because that is what I had a lot of experience with is being a manager in sales. So I'm like, okay, great. So they said, okay, well, we need you to sit down with, I forget what position it was. It was like the head honcho. 
tomorrow to have a one-on-one. I was like, okay, great. So the next day I come in, I sit down, having a conversation, and it's made plain to me that if I'm going to succeed as a manager, I am going to have to skirt the law in certain ways. And I'm like, what? So I had kind of heard through the grapevine that there were supervisors, there were managers there who were doctoring financial aid paperwork. They were also doctoring up uh, records for students beginning classes because the big deal was that, I mean, and I didn't know this at the time because I had never worked in education before. And honestly, it ends up, <laughs> turns out that I really wasn't working education there either. But basically what they needed students to do is they needed students to start their class because once they attended class, once they attended so many hours of class, then their financial aid money was released from the government. So the reality was that this company really didn't care if students finished. They cared that the students started so that that Pell Grant money and other student loan money would flow in. And if the student decided they wanted to drop out, well, then, you know, let them drop out. So I was effectively told that I would need to do these things. And I said, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Absolutely not. I'm like, so I can go to prison for fucking around with the federal government? Uh-uh. I said, I'm more than happy to continue doing what I'm doing because I'm doing things the right way. I'm not, you know, harassing people or anything like that. I'm not twisting anybody's arm, but I am getting enrollments and people are starting their classes. So I go back to my desk, which was kind of funny. This was one of these places where the more successful you were, the more they like played you up. So I had a spot that was like a primo window seat. I could look outside and, you know, all this other stuff. So I'm there about an hour, hour and a half, and I am then escorted from the building because I am fired. <laughs> so, so I'm like, yeah, okay. So I get home, and of course, I am just steaming. I am so pissed off. So I write an email to the head honcho informing them that in the morning, I am going to go talk to every news channel I can possibly get a hold of and tell them about what's really going on. Because at this point in time, this uh, American Intercontinental University was being talked up on the news and said, oh, wow, what a, what a big new employer they were. And wow, they're incredibly successful. And there's another hiring, you know, this kind of bullshit. Stacking Limit is talking about their experience and how they got screwed with their student loans. So Stacking Limit will probably know a little bit about where this story ends up. So anyway, so I'm pissed because now I'm out of a job and I haven't done anything wrong. Although the reality was, as soon as I heard that, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get the fuck out of here but I'm going to find another job first. So I send the email. Next morning, I get a phone call. And it's from a private investigator. I'll never forget this guy's name. His last name was O'Callaghan, a fellow Irishman. And he said he's calling in regards to the email I had sent to so-and-so. And would I be willing to sit down with him and an attorney for the college to discuss what's going on because they want to get to the bottom of this. They want to fix this. They want to address this. 
I said, sure, fine. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm more than happy to meet you at a restaurant that was on the northwest side of the city. I got something in my eye for a second. And called the Blue Angel. Those out there who lived in Chicago probably remember it. It's gone now. But it was a it was a restaurant that was open 24 hours. I didn't live far from it. So I said, I'll meet you there tomorrow, XYZ time, whatever. So rolls around, I go, I sit down, see these two guys, and I pull out a recorder. And I say, just so you know, I am going to record this conversation. Because if you threaten me in any way, or even seem like you're threatening me in any way, I will go to the authorities. And this guy O'Callaghan says, well, you can't record this conversation because we're in a public place. You're going to violate the civil rights of everyone around us. You cannot record this conversation. I said, okay. All right. So the lawyer's talking to me like, Okay, so what was going on? What was, what was told to you? Blah, 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 this and that. And a private investigator is sitting there and he's more focused on what's it going to cost? So he's asking me questions like, uh, so how much uh, were you making? Well, I told him. And he said, well, how long do you think it's going to take you to find a new job? How long you know, do you think you might be out of work? And I said, I don't know. I said, yeah, it's not necessarily a great economy right now. I said, I might be out of work for a year. I don't know. I have no idea. That's a stupid question to ask me. So he's like, so uh, your lost wages, what would you say? Like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000? Is that about right? Would you say that's, that's in the ballpark? And I'm like, well, if I were out of work for a year, yeah, that's, that's the ballpark. Okay, all right, you know. So we wrap up the conversation. And like I said, this, this PI just, it seems like he's just there to find out what is my price tag. So we leave it at that. And one guy, uh, the lawyer said, well, if we brought you back on board, would that be acceptable? I said, I said no. I said, of course not. I'm not going back to work there. So, okay, well, we'll be in touch. Well, they were in touch. The private investigator called me later on that night to offer me $60,000 to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And I said, well, let me think about it. So, of course... I talked to Elliot, my best friend. If you watch the show, you, you know who Elliot is. Scott Weagle, he knows Elliot. Talked to my brother, Greg. Talked to my mom. I didn't talk to my dad about it. I forget why. I think he was in Ireland with my stepmom. So I didn't talk to him. So... I'm not necessarily always the brightest bulb on the string, you know? So I'm talking to Elliot, my mom, my brother, and I'm like, well, they're offering $60,000. But I know this is a billion-dollar industry with these guys. I bet you I could ask for more, and I bet you they'll pay it. And everybody was like, well, you know, Ask him for as much as, as you can. I said, okay. So I call this guy back, O'Callaghan back the next day. Oh, no, he calls me to see if I've decided, if I made up my mind. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm more than happy to sign a non-disclosure agreement for $250,000. He's like, what? I said, yeah. I said, I will sign a non-disclosure agreement for 
for $250,000. You're out of your mind. Blah, blah, blah. Hector Stafford's with us in chat. Uh, so Hector Stafford says, it's the kind of situation I'd reach out to a lawyer. I did. I asked uh, someone whose friend was, I mean, they weren't like a criminal attorney or something, but they were an attorney. And I said, hey, can I get in trouble for this? And they said, no, it's a non-disclosure agreement. They're, they're asking you to sign a non-disclosure agreement for X amount of dollars. And you're just coming back with, well, no, I'm not going to sign it for that. I'll sign it for this. They said, no, there's nothing illegal about that. People sign non-disclosure agreements all the time. Okay. So anyway, so Callahan's saying, ah, oh, yeah, this guy, you're out of your mind. I said, well, you know, get back to me. Let me know. So a couple of days go by. I don't hear anything. So he calls me back and he says, all right. So I'm supposed to get you under, I forget the phrase he used. And I said, what does that mean? He said, I'm supposed to get you to sign the non-disclosure agreement for less than $100,000. I said, no. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do $200,000 and I will sign the non-disclosure agreement. Well, I'll have to get back to you. A few days go by, calls me, and he says, okay, we got a deal. So what I want you to do, I want you to meet me, this was downtown Chicago, at a particular location it was public. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have uh, all the paperwork for you to sign, and I will have a check for $200,000. And I said, okay, well, it's got to be a cashier's check. I said, I will not accept, uh, you know, a check that can easily be voided. I said, I, it's got to be a cashier's check. He said, fine. So anyway, so... Tell my brother, tell my mom, I tell Elliot, okay, this is the situation. And I tell Elliot, I'm meeting this guy at this time. If you do not hear from me within an hour of that time, something's up. Here's his phone number. I said, because as, as weird as this may sound, for an industry this big, it wouldn't be like, just completely out of the realm of possibility that they would just try to kill me. So <laughs> Kabuki Kid says this story is wild. Uh, it gets better. So I go downtown. And it's, it's actually at a restaurant and bar that I'm meeting O'Callaghan. And I, I walk in and it's him and a woman. And she says, oh, this is my partner. She's working with me. We're, we're going to meet another client, blah, blah, blah. So he says, here's the check. He hands me the check in an envelope. I took a look. And I had actually told him when I sat down that multiple people knew where I was and had his phone number. Let him know that right off the bat. He's like, it's like this isn't a movie. I said, well, I'd, I'm just telling you. So pulls out a piece of paper. I read it. He goes, yeah, I just need you to sign that. I said, this is it? I said, you don't need me to sign anything other than just this? He says, yeah, that's all I need you to sign. Okay. I sign it. He and the woman get up. They leave. And I go to the bathroom because I got to pee. So anyway, so it was, it was like fall. So it was kind of cool. So I had a jacket on. So I took the check and I tucked it into my pocket of the jacket. And I walk outside and I get jumped by six undercover Chicago police officers who throw me to the ground. And they're doing the old fucking chokehold stuff on me. They're like, oh, you're under arrest. Where's the check? Where's the check? And it was a good thing that I went to the bathroom because I guarantee you, I would have pissed myself in a second. So they 
pull me up from the ground and slam me against the wall and reach into my pocket and pull out the check. And, ha- and there's O'Callaghan standing there and he hands it over. And he says, the undercover cop says, you're under arrest. And they throw me into an unmarked car. So I'm like, oh, man. They're not even putting me in a, in a regular police car. So they take me down to Cook County, which is Cook County Jail. I don't know if it's still around or what, but Cook County Jail was like the shithole jail of the city. And I proceed to sit there. Nobody will tell me what I'm charged with. I even asked the, the cop who was in the back seat with me in the unmarked car. I said, what am I under arrest for? And he's like, he just sat there and said, shut the fuck up. I said, you're not even reading me my rights, which they didn't. They didn't read me my Miranda. And when I said that, he looked at me and once again said, shut the fuck up. So I shut the fuck up. So they processed me, haven't charged me with anything. They have a detective come in with somebody else and they interview me and I tell them the story. I tell them exactly what's happened. Okay, okay. I'm like, I don't know why I'm here. All I'm doing is I'm supposed to have been signing a non-disclosure agreement. There's nothing illegal about that. So I'm there for about 11 hours. Nobody's saying shit to me. And then somebody walks in and I'm in a holding cell, just cooling my heels in a holding cell. And they come in and they tell me that I'm being charged with, uh, what the hell was it? Grand theft of $200,000 which is like a class A felony because they said they would have charged me with blackmail, but there really isn't a statute in Illinois for blackmail. So then I proceed to spend three days cooling my heels in Cook County Jail And I am beyond scared out of my wits. But I'm not playing it up that way. So I thought to myself, okay, so I will just have this completely disinterested look on my face so that people leave me alone. And I actually had people coming up asking me questions because they thought, well, obviously, you know your way around here. And I just, my answer to every question was, I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. Like, whatever. Calvinoni is joining us in the midst of the story. Uh, Cal says, I don't know why you didn't bring some friends with you. There wasn't anything they were going to do. What, were they going to fight the undercover cops? (laughs) Come on. So anyway, so uh, finally, I get bailed out. So what, it, what ends up happening is, of course, Elliot doesn't hear from me, and he's freaking out. So he calls this PI who proceeds to tell him the exact words were, your buddy is out of the box, which is like a baseball term, like, you're out of there, like, So anyway, so Elliot's freaking out. Now, Elliot's brother at the time just happened to be the sheriff of Oak uh, Oak Brook, Illinois. I almost said Oak Park. Oak Brook, Illinois. So Elliot calls his brother, and his brother calls this guy, and he tells him, he says, all right, I'm going to tell you who I am. He explains who he is, and he says, you are either going to tell me where Jeff McAleer is or I am going to track your phone 
and I'm going to arrest you for kidnapping. And O'Callaghan says, oh, he's at Cook County. He's being processed at Cook County. Uh, so Kelton says, is this real life right now? Yeah, this, this is an absolutely true story. This is an absolutely true story. Kel says they're supposed to beat the answers into you. I didn't kill anybody. So anyway, so my dad comes with my brother and they bail me out. And of course, my dad's super pissed off. And my brother's trying to explain to my dad, I've done nothing wrong. That this is a setup that they're trying to discredit me. So luckily, I had a good friend of mine that his childhood friend that he was still very close friends with was one of the top criminal attorneys in Chicago. And my friend Mike said, you know what? I'm going to give him a call. And he, said, he agreed to meet me. So I went down there, gave him the whole story. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll take your case. And I said, I got to be honest. I said, there's no way. My family and I cannot afford your fees. And he said, well, I'm going to do Mike a favor. He said, I'm not going to do it for free, but I'm going to do it for a lot less than we normally would. Okay. So we then proceed to have to keep going back to court. And the state just keeps putting it off, putting it off. We need an extension. We need an extension. We need an extension, Your Honor. So I get a job working for a college. And I tell them right up front what's going on. And I explain what happened. I tell them that, you know, there are going to be days that I have to take off because I have to go to fucking court. And they really wanted me. And uh, it was a brick and mortar college. It was a, an actual university. Well, college wasn't a university. It was a college. And they were like, it's okay. That, you know, that we understand. I'm like, all right. So, uh, like I said, I keep going back and forth. And we finally go. And we figure that this is where we're finally going to see if this is going to go to trial or not. Because that's what kept going on. We kept going in front of the judge and the judge was supposed to make a ruling if this case would go forward or if it would be dismissed. So we go to court and my friend Mike goes with, and it was funny, he's like, I'm not going in the courthouse. I said, you're not. He goes, no, man, I don't want to jinx it. I'll stay out here. I'll stay out here. He had a, uh, a, a ranger. So I said, I'll, I'll sit out here. I'll wait out here. And uh, good luck. And I'm like, okay. So, so anyway, so finally the state is ready to proceed and present their evidence to the judge. So they have this state's attorney who's making me out like I'm Osama bin Laden. And the story is that I contacted the school and I demanded money. And I said, oh, I will ruin you and blah, 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 this and that. And they get and they say they've got numerous witnesses, numerous witnesses. Well, the only witnesses they would have would be the lawyer who sat with us at the restaurant, the private investigator, of course, and the woman who was at the bar, the restaurant bar, who watched me sign a piece of paper. Those are your witnesses. But according to the state, boy, they had people lined up. We're just going to tear me to shreds. So he has O'Callaghan get up on the stand, the prosecutor, and starts asking him questions. And O'Callaghan says, well, I had contacted him and I demanded money and he was, you know, blah, 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 this and that. And 
the prosecutor says, okay, your honor, I've got no further questions. And at one point I was, I went, oh. and my lawyer said, Jeff, don't laugh. I said, I'm not laughing. I said, he's lying. And it was so weird because here we're in this courtroom and there's other cases that are waiting to be heard. And these, and you can see people are like leaning in like, man, this is, this is weird. This is, this is a bizarre story. So the first thing my attorney asks Mr. O'Callaghan is, how did I contact him? And he said, well, he called me. And he said, no, what I'm asking you is, how did my client contact you? How did my, cl my client know who you are? How would he know who you are? Then all of a sudden he's like, uh, well, um, maybe I called him. Because he was saying that the college had brought him in to investigate these allegations. So, of course, my attorney starts proving that they didn't bring him in to investigate any allegations because he even says he never looked into anything about what I alleged was going on at the school. So my attorney says, so Mr. O'Callaghan, what you're saying is you were brought in to offer my client money to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which is completely legal. And he even brought up Michael Jackson because Michael Jackson had just recently had some non-disclosure agreement signed by some kid's family and he gave them a bunch of money. He said, there is absolutely nothing illegal about a non-disclosure agreement. And of course, this dickhead's pushing back. So finally, my attorney says, Mr. O'Callaghan, when you first met my client at the Blue Angel restaurant, my client asked you, or no, I should say, my client told you he was going to record your conversation and you told him he couldn't. And O'Callaghan says, yeah, that's right, because he would have violated everybody's civil rights. And my attorney said, Mr. O'Callaghan, do you realize that my client did record the conversation that took place at the Blue Angel restaurant? Kind of left that part out of the story, huh? Judge threw it out. And the judge was pissed at the prosecutor. And, and at one point, I think he had actually said to the private investigator that he be, better be really careful because he was coming very close to perjuring himself. So anyway, I'll never forget. I'm standing there. I start getting ready. You know, we're dismissed. And I'm getting ready to, to walk out. And my attorney says, wait, Jeff, hold on. Said the losers walk out of court first. So we walk out and he says, come on, let's go celebrate. I'll take you and Mike out for breakfast. I said, okay. So he tells us where. And I go and I get into uh, my, my buddy Mike's truck and I break down and I'm sobbing and I can't stop sobbing uncontrollably for about 10 minutes. Because it turned out that if that had gone to trial, if I was found guilty, that would have gotten me about 17 years in pound you in the ass prison. So we haven't gotten to the point where I discuss why you don't fuck with me. So I'm working at this college and the dean of the, the president, I should say, of the college was this millionaire who was a big, uh, big contributor to the Democratic Party. And he was real nice and I would talk to him all the time. And he had actually been brought in to turn the college around because the college was... On, on the verge of going under. 
And he was a businessman and they brought him in to put more like business, you know, dealings in the minds of the administration. So of course I was working in admissions. So I would give prospective students tours and things like that. So I'm talking to my boss and I tell him, okay, this is what happened. You know, it's, it's been thrown out. And I had said to my attorney, I said, I want to sue these fuckers. This was over the breakfast. And he said, I got to be honest. I don't think you should do that. He said, because it is possible that they could actually convene a grand jury and have a grand jury decide that, yes, this is going to go to trial. He said, I highly doubt something like that is going to happen, but it could. He said, so he said something along the lines of, we wrestled the bear once, let's not push our luck a second time. I said, okay, all right. So anyway, so I had told my boss at the time, uh, okay, you know, it's all done and stuff like that. He said, so, so that's a huge weight off your shoulders, right? I said, yeah. I said, but you know what? I I don't want to let them get away with this. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you talk to so-and-so, the president of the college all the time. Tell him the story. I said, okay. So I make an appointment to go in and speak with him. And I go in and he didn't know what was going on. Only my boss knew. And one of my friends who I was working with knew what was going on. So I tell him the story. And he says, well, I happen to have a friend who's a producer at 60 Minutes. How about if I give her your information, kind of tell her the story, and, you know, maybe they'll want to pursue this. Okay, cool. Three days later, I get a call from a producer from 60 Minutes. And I proceed to tell her the story. And she says, you know, we've been thinking about pursuing a story about these bogus colleges and, and, and stuff like that. I said, well, I said, the real story here isn't, you know, the shenanigans that they're, they're pulling on their students. It's the shenanigans they're doing with government funds. So she had asked me if I wanted to go on camera, and I said, no, I do not. I said, but I can point you in the right direction. I can actually give you the names of some people that might roll over on them. I said, but myself personally, I am not. She's like, oh, well, you know, we could make it where you're anonymous. And, and I'm like, no, 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 sorry. So about eight months later, 60 Minutes does a story about these, I guess they would, I guess they were presenting them like diploma mills or just, you know, these kind of bogus colleges. And they talked about a few places, but they mainly focused on Career Education Corporation. And within days, their stock price plummeted. And then the feds got involved and they lost their regional accreditation. Now, if you've been watching, I opened up this story talking about education with regional accreditation. And if your classes, your coursework is not regionally accredited, none of it is going to transfer into another school. And most places will be like, yeah, okay. Your degree is not worth the piece of paper it's printed on. So then, like I said, they lost their regional accreditation. So their stock prices bottomed out even further. So at the end of the day, because they fucked with me, it cost them billions of dollars and their accreditation. Now they are still around. They still exist. American Intercontinental University still exists. Career Education Corporation still exists, but in no way, shape, or form like they did 
before I got a hold of them. So that's what I mean by don't fuck with me. So there you have it. There is uh, a story that has absolutely nothing to do with tabletop gaming. And I, I'm sure in some ways people are probably watching this or they'll watch this after the fact and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, you were being shifty, Jeff. And I wasn't. There's nothing illegal about a non-disclosure agreement. And if somebody offers me $60,000 to not talk about something, there's absolutely, once again, my attorney brought this up. There is absolutely nothing illegal about a counteroffer. So, yep. So that's pretty wild. Pretty wild. So that is probably the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Because, I mean, the reality is, strangely enough, if I didn't have that one friend who was a childhood friend of one of the top criminal attorneys in Chicago, I would have probably ended up with a public defender. And we all know how good public defenders tend to be, how overworked they are, and how they really don't put in a whole lot of effort in each of their cases. But of course, I did hold off on the fact that I did have that recording because it just makes it a better story. James X said, love that story. Just been telling folks to kick rocks for decades. Flint Fireforge says, don't mess with Jeff or karma will get you. That really is what it was. It was karma. It, it was certainly karma. So Kelvin says, that was cool. Perkins says, best part is getting the recording. <laughs> get out of jail free. Or get out of bang you in the ass prison free. A Coco B says, what's with these detectives telling stories about blackmail and steam tunnels and such? Uh, so the PI turned out he was an ex-cop. So what we assumed was that those, uh, those undercover cops were his pals that were just, you know, kind of doing him a favor. Or maybe they were dirty cops. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't want to accuse anybody of being a dirty cop. But I will say that the PI was shady as fuck. I mean, the impression I got was that Career Education Corporation was willing to pay the $200,000 to get the non-disclosure agreement. And the PI probably talked them into going with, well, let's just have them arrested. Then you don't have to pay anything. And then we shut him up. And then we discredit him too. So Kevin R. Smith says, it certainly helped that you knew the actual laws about recording in Illinois. That might explain why they used an unmarked car. Cal says they were corrupt. Like I said, I don't know. I, I honestly do not know. Perkins Dearborn says their uncle was an Oregon District Court judge. I took his advice when he offered it. Yeah, I sure would too. So Kevin R. Smith says that was an amazing wild story. Yes, it is not a story that I tell very often. Because in my opinion, I don't look too great in it. Because I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'll let them get, get away with breaking the law if you give me $200,000. Anyway, oh, Rogue Thinker's popping in. I guess I missed it again. I'll come back to it later. Sounds like it was good. Eh, maybe. I don't know. It's certainly, like I said, not gaming related. So my apologies for that. I'm sure someone will complain in the comments. I don't need these shows to be an hour and a half long, man. <laughs> All righty then. So I'm going to wrap up for this evening. If you're watching live, thank you very much. If you watched live and hung around for that entire tale, <laughs> bigger thank you. Because I know it kind of dragged on. But of course, if you're watching live and took part in chat, big tip of the cap 
Because not only are you keeping me company, you're keeping each other company as well. But of course, I know a lot of people, you don't have an opportunity to watch live. Doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Thank you very much for taking time out to watch any of the videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more you will not find here on this YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. I should also mention with this new format where I'm kind of tackling a topic every night, if there's something you would like me to kind of dive into, shoot me an email. Let me know because as I pointed out before, I don't know if I'm going to be able to come up with a topic every night for the live stream. Granted, it's three a week, but still, it's probably a little harder than we expect. Anywho, everybody enjoy the rest of your week. Have a great weekend. I will be sharing the Paizo preview for March, including a peek inside the Monster Core for Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remastered. So that will be on the horizon. That should be up tomorrow. So keep your eyes peeled for that. But enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time of day it is in your neck of the woods. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. I'll be back on Tuesday. And as always, I certainly hope every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. And of course, don't forget, Subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, give it a thumbs up, you know the rest.